Hi, everyone. I have refrained from commenting on Israel-Gaza so far because the topic is simply so contentious and holds so many strong emotions. But as someone who teaches women's leadership and leadership and emotional self-regulation and does workshops on anti-Semitism, I feel an obligation to say something about what is going on in Israel and Gaza. Uh, so first of all, as many of you know, I am a proud Jewish woman. I worked for the American Jewish Committee. I'm also a women's leadership trainer, and I did workshops actually last year for women in Israel uh, and in Gaza and the West Bank, uh, helping women to design feminist change initiatives and doing women's empowerment workshops for them. Uh, the women in Palestine were lovely. They were funny. They were smart. Uh, they developed cool feminist change initiatives. They wanted to run for office. They wanted to create women-only cafes. They wanted to create childcare centers, uh, their own businesses. They were a, a fun and enthusiastic group of young women that genuinely wanted change in their, their country, uh, but also wanted change for women. Uh, women in Gaza do not have it well. The unemployment rate is far higher, was far higher than the general unemployment rate. Also, patriarchal norms that are unfortunately embedded in the law, majorly disadvantaged women. One woman said to me, you know, I, I, I got a uh, internship that they promised to turn into a job. And then when they turned it into a job, the salary wasn't even enough to pay for my bus fare to get to the job. And it's kind of seen that women will work for free. Uh, they also told me about brothers killing their sisters uh, in order to gain access to inheritance because honor killings are not prosecuted to the same extent as murders. So a lot of really messed up parts of Palestinian, both Gaza and uh, West Bank society that disenfranchised women. And obviously they were, you know, their opportunities were severely limited by being cut off from the West of the world. I actually, truthfully, hadn't really known about, you know, that when we look at Palestine, there's Gaza and there's the West Bank. And the West Bank has much more freedom of movement, has a much lower unemployment rate. Uh, that's because the West Bank has been controlled by the Palestinian Authority, whereas Gaza in 2007, they had a democratic election and unfortunately Hamas won. Now, it's I remember having a uh, hosting a panel at that point for the American Jewish Committee on what happens when a terrorist group wins in a democratic process or an, an anti-democratic group wins in a democratic process. And it was quite frightening, the predictions. I think it's also really important to understand that Hamas is not a normal leader, um, as we can see from the way that they uh, decapitated babies and raped women and just the horrific burned people alive, the horrific reports that we're hearing um, from the, the, the intentional massacre of civilians at the music concert in the kibbutzim, um, people that were civilians just living their lives as normal people. Um, we can obviously see that Hamas is not fit to run any sort of government. Uh, it's also a terrorist group, and it's also um, important to understand that its charter spreads propaganda about Jews. So one text from Hamas's charter uh, says, the day of judgment will not come about until Muslims fight Jews and kill them. Then the Jews will hide behind rocks and trees, and the rocks and trees will cry out, a Muslim, there is a Jew hiding behind me, come and kill him. Another text says uh, peace initiatives and so-called peaceful solutions and international conferences are in contradiction to the principles of the Islamic resistance movement. So here they're clearly saying that we don't want peace, that violence and jihad is part of our, our nature and what should be pursued. Those conferences are no more than a means to appoint the infidels as arbitrators in the lands of Islam. There is no solution for the Palestinian problem except by jihad. Initiatives, proposals, and international conferences are but a waste of time and an exercise in futility. So as we look at Hamas's charter, we can see, A, that there is a lack of interest in peace talks, a lack of interest in, uh, in peace, and uh, a clear call to kill Jews, which is why we've heard some horrifying uh, recordings of you know, people, this man calling his father and bragging about all the Jews that he killed with his own hands because the Hamas charter says, well, that's what you're supposed to do. This is this is how we're, we're reaching salvation. Uh, and this is what you're supposed to be doing. 
So, you know, we have to understand why Hamas uh, or why Gaza has been cut off since 2007. Uh, it, Egypt used to be actually a lot more open. And then the militants blew up, um, blew up, believe it was some of the checkpoints to Egypt. And then Egypt blocked off um, uh, majorly. There's still a little bit of entrance, but majorly entrance from Palestinians into Egypt. Uh, and so did Israel with the rocket fire and the tunnels that were coming in. Uh, there was also a push by Gaza to withdraw from Gaza. So Israel withdrew. Um, and it was very controversial at the time of Israel bringing in troops to forcibly remove settlers from Gaza uh, and take them out of Gaza into Israel. But that also meant there was no more Jews in Gaza, and so it kind of could be cut off from the rest of the world. Very limited freedom of movement, not able to go to the airport and go somewhere for the weekend. Uh, and you could you could feel that in the young women there. I, there was also clearly a, a lower level of education, a lower level of English speaking. Um, a more a higher level of conservatism, generally speaking, I just saw in my workshops much more women wearing hijabs in Gaza than in the West Bank. Um, but these were lovely women. And as I, you know, hear about the refugee camps that are bombed and about the, you know, strikes that Israel is um, is doing right now uh, against Hamas, but that unfortunately is having serious collateral damage against civilians, I can't help but wondering uh, wonder if those women that I taught last year and coached and helped are still alive. Uh, and it gives me so much pain. And the, the more that we have our amygdalas fire at one another, and the more that you know, I'm 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 genuinely just worried seeing the amount of civilian casualties in Gaza, the lack of humanitarian aid that's able to get in, the hospitals without generators. Uh, at the same time, you know, as Americans, we have to think about this is like their 9/11, um, and and you know the the way that people were killed in their homes and the Israeli government's um, lack of knowledge or, or ability to prevent these attacks and uh, of keeping their civilians safe, which is the most you know kind of primordial function of a government is to keep its citizens safe and that they obviously have to do something and they have to go after Hamas. Unfortunately, Hamas uses the population as human shields, which also leads me to wonder why more people are not calling out for Hamas to take responsibility and release hostages to help lead to a ceasefire and why all of the blame is being targeted against Israel. I think from the Jewish perspective too, a lot of people are seeing people pray for Gaza, uh, pray for Palestinians, but they didn't express any sort of anger or disgust at all when the attacks against Israel were perpetrated by Hamas, these disgusting attacks that frankly, you or I could have easily been at, at a music festival in the North, just hanging out with friends and having a good time. And the next thing you know, our head is being chopped off. This could happen to literally any of us. And that there wasn't the level of disgust or horror by people who weren't Jewish to the extent that I think the Jewish community felt like we should have um, after that happened. And yet the outpouring of support for Palestinians and even so far as having college professors saying that, you know, Israelis deserved it, uh, that the Jews deserved it. It's just, it's really deeply unsettling. Uh, the other thing that I want to really make clear is that I think right now is the time where we really need to make the effort to reach across the aisle and try to understand one another. Uh, and that violence is not the answer. My friend Victor Ochen from the Bellagio Fellowship that I just left at the Rockefeller Foundation, from, by the Rockefeller Foundation, uh, who was a Nobel Peace Prize nominee, he started a peace club when he was 13 in a refugee camp in Uganda, even though he was being encouraged to take up arms. His brother had been disappeared by the Lord's Resistance Army, and he still has not found them. And Victor said to me, you know, I had this moment where I could choose to take up arms or I could choose peace. And I realized that taking up arms would just escalate the conflict. It wouldn't actually help. It would just perpetuate the violence that we're seeing. It wouldn't actually help anything or heal society, which is really what we needed was healing. So he started this peace club, transformed into the Af African Youth Initiative Network. He's rehabilitated like 3,000 child soldiers from the Lord's Resistance Army with his organization and rehabilitated them. I really looked to him as, a, as an example and a model of 
reaching for peace, even when every piece of you is screaming out to blame, to point fingers, to be violent, to hate. Um, the other thing I want to make clear is that we're seeing a rise in anti-Semitism and also of Islamophobia. I had a friend who was harassed yesterday at a cafe at a Starbucks in New York with someone following her, demanding to know if she was Jewish. Um, and she didn't respond and he kept harassing her and walked into Starbucks while she's trying to order her chai latte. And finally, she just started speaking in Spanish back to him. No comprende, yo no sé qué paso, blah, 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 blah. So... <laughs> You know, there's there's Jews that are being followed around, Jews that are being attacked. Um, Jewish students do not feel safe. And there's horrible epithets on social media about, you know, eliminating Jewish students and all sorts of disgusting things. Guards being put outside Jewish schools and synagogues. Um, people like myself are scared to walk around in big cities where there are protests happening and to exhibit anything that might say that we're Jewish. Um, I actually applaud my friend for continuing to wear her Jewish star because I am frightened to do so uh, in, in an area where I know that there is a strong pro-Palestinian contingency. And one more thing I think is really, you know, needs to be understood is that blaming Jewish people for the actions of the Israeli government is anti-Semitic in itself. Uh, I am, you know, sad to tell you that I do not have Benjamin Netanyahu on speed dial, and neither do all of my friends. Um, and in fact, Jews, including most secular Jews in Israel, have been deeply critical of the Netanyahu administration because it's been extremely right wing. And he's displayed things like trying to release himself from culpability for massive levels of corruption by dissolving the judiciary. Totally anti-democratic. We don't like that, Netanyahu. And most secular Jews also don't like Netanyahu. Uh, so blaming Jews for the actions of the Israeli government is anti-Semitic and also incorrect. And it's, you know, it's ignorant. And, I, you know, I also recognize that people are facing Islamophobia. My friend and fellow women's rights activist, Lena, told me she can't wear her sweatpants out that say, hey, darling, in Arabic on leg, because it it's perceived as political and she gets all sorts of hate. So we have to understand that, you know, both of these communities are being marginalized and attacked. And ironically, to me, that says that that's all the more reason for the Jewish and Muslim communities to come together right now uh, versus to be at each other's throats. I, I just keep thinking of Maria Stefan and Erica Chenoweth's with his work as well, which says that nonviolent resistance is more effective than violent terrorist action. It's because more people can participate and they aren't uh, put off from participating by the fact that they have to pick up arms. Uh, it also doesn't incur this, the massive civilian casualties that backtrack from the statement or the progress that they're trying uh, to make. Uh, it's also important to be aware that Hamas was absolutely 1000% aware of the Israeli onslaught that was going to occur, mostly against the Gazan civilian population because of their despicable actions, and they don't care. Uh, I mean, they even have food and all sorts of supplies in the tunnels underneath um, underneath Gaza that they have not used and brought to bear to help the civilians that are now suffering. Uh, Hamas's leaders are extremely wealthy because they've stolen a lot of the money that was coming for Gaza aid uh, and development beforehand and put it into their own pockets, uh, a, a truly corrupt uh, and disgusting government. Uh, the other thing that I think to be aware of is that one of the big blockers to a two-state solution in the past was a lack of trust amongst Israeli Druze. Um, and the, the reason that they had lack of trust is they had a lack of trust in Palestinian objectives. And sadly, what Hamas has now done is proven these Israelis right, is that Hamas doesn't want peace and coexistence. They don't want a two-state solution where they live peacefully next to each other. They want the destruction of Israel and of the Israeli people. And now you know, some of us are wondering the Jewish community, did they want this ripple effect where all these other communities all over the world now are uh, acting out against not just the Israelis, but against Jewish communities from France to the UK to right here in New York City. So, you know, the, these actions have really made it much harder for there to be a two-state solution. And it's very clear that there will not be a two-state solution if Hamas is in any way involved at all.
There is a author named Stephen Frosch, and he talks about the dialogue on the Israeli-Palestinian conflict as guilt-oriented, and he classifies guilt orientation as uh, accusatory, a manipulation of the elements of reality that prove things are caused by the other side, systematic evidence and coercion, and the exposition of fragility. Uh, he specifically says that complexities disappear and everything becomes thick, black, and white patterns. He also says that sheltering behind black and white characterizations poses a practical problem because it blinds us from understanding and thus undermines our long-term ability to prevent and surmount what we don't know and most fear. Uh, that becomes a war of accusations, blame, anger, and violence. And I think what is so critical to understand right now is not to play the blame game and not to say this is your fault or this is your fault or you know you did this and you did this or you know this having this victim competition of well there were more deaths here who had more deaths and who suffered more let's face it the palestinians have suffered tremendously and the jews have suffered tremendously um you know we both have been alienated peoples in a sense and you know, taking out anger and emotion at the other side doesn't really actually help us. Um, it's really the time where we need to understand that as Sophie Tarnoska, who's one of my Women's Leadership Challenge alums and the founder of Versus, which does dialogue between divided societies, says that we need to understand that when our core identities are threatened, this is when we're activated the most. So when you see something that touches upon one of your core identities, that's when your amygdala, which is the threat center of the brain, takes over and your prefrontal cortex, which is the executive decision-making area of the brain, shuts down. And you're much more likely to react without thinking, without actually coming to a sound, logical, and rational um, sentence or you know what, what it is that you want to say because you're in threat mode. You're in fight or flight. You're not in the mode of having a diplomatic conversation. I also keep thinking about, you know, these different uh, initiatives to bring Israelis and Palestinians together uh, to understand each other, to know each other, to create peace from a music school in Berlin, Germany, uh, that, you know, Israelis, Palestinians and Ira Iranians play music together uh, and to a collaborative of um, called the Seeds of Peace which has been a summer camp for years that brings us that started with bringing Israelis and Palestinian students together and has brought together many other divided communities to a, um, a young woman's group that where Palestinian and Israeli young women come together for peace purposes to my own community of women, uh, you know, Arab and Jewish existing together in the same community, not engaging in a blame game and really trying to process our emotions and heal uh, with Sophie's help uh, and as well as to figure out what are ways that we can actually take action that will move us closer to peace and further away from violence. Um, so if you watch this entire video, I hope you take this time to take a deep breath and figure out how to reach across the aisle, even if it's uh, even if every fiber of you is telling you to do the opposite. And if you're interested in workshops on anti-Semitism or conflict de-escalation or, uh, or tools for conversations and triggering times, you can reach out to me or to Sophie and we'd be pleased to come to your workplace and help people through this difficult time.